the global geopolitical positioning around AI heats up, but at the same time, some signs of cooperation are appearing as well. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown. It's very clear if you spend any time watching politics or digging into geopolitics especially, that artificial intelligence has very quickly become a key dimension of the international conversation. Now, it is a factor both in terms of how countries relate to one another, but also how they view themselves internally, how they view their internal competitiveness, and how they view their relationship with entrepreneurship and business. Today we're talking about a set of stories that all show how different geopolitical actors are making moves around AI to position themselves in what has become an increasingly important global game. We start here in the U.S. with the announcement of the new National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource. Now, this came out of President Joe Biden's executive order on AI. One of the things that was articulated in that executive order, which, by the way, was, I think, the longest executive order in U.S. history, was that the United States needed to focus on not only its global competitiveness relative to the rest of the world, but also making sure that there was equitable access within the U.S. to the infrastructure for participating in the AI revolution. And that is where the NAIRR comes in. Basically, the National Science Foundation and 10 other agencies, including DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, NASA, the National Institutes of Health, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, have come together with a set of private sector partners as well to launch this new resource. The 15 private sector partners include many who took that voluntary AI pledge, including Amazon Web Services, Anthropic, AMD, Google, Hugging Face, IBM, Intel, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, OpenAI, and Palantir. So what does the NAIRR do? Well, it gives people access to AI models, access to compute, access to data sets, software, and training, and makes it available for U.S.-based researchers. The announcement post was called Democratizing the Future of AI R&D. The director of the National Science Foundation said in a statement, To continue leading in AI research and development, we must create opportunities across the country to advance AI innovation and strengthen educational opportunities, empowering the nation to shape international standards and igniting economic growth. The NSF blog post continues, The NAIR pilot will initially support AI research to advance safe, secure, and trustworthy AI, as well as the application of AI to challenges in healthcare and environment and infrastructure sustainability. The pilot's operations will be organized into four areas of focus. NAIR Open will enable open AI research through access to diverse AI resources via the NAIR Pilot Portal and coordinated allocations. NAIR Secure will enable AI research requiring privacy and security-preserving resources and will assemble exemplary privacy-preserving resources. NAIR Software will facilitate and investigate interoperable use of AI software platforms, tools, and services for NAIR Pilot resources. And NAIR Classroom will reach new communities through education, training, user support, and outreach. When you go to the NAIR pilot webpage, which is at nairrpilot.org, it puts the focus as spurring innovation, increasing the diversity of talent, improving capacity, and advancing trustworthy AI. Now, researchers who are interested in this can go on this site, again, nairpilot.org, and participate in a set of various opportunities. For example, researchers, educators, and students can fill out a survey that hopes to give the organization more information about the challenges that those groups face. They can see a set of pilot resources that include things like pre-trained models, AI-ready datasets, and other relevant platforms. Or researchers can apply for computing allocations. Now, when it comes to those computing allocations, the applications are open between now and March 1st of this year. They identify the thematic focus of the allocation call as safe, secure, and trustworthy AI, with research they're interested in around areas like testing, evaluating, verifying, and validating AI systems, increasing the interpretability and privacy of learned models, reducing the vulnerability of models to families of adversarial attacks, etc. There are six specific compute resource locations that people can apply to or say they don't have a preference. And of course, the question will be how much of a dent these resources make in who has access to actually do advanced research in the AI space. It certainly would seem to be better that it exists than it doesn't, but given just the sheer quantity of compute that is necessary, It'll be interesting to see whether it actually changes anything around the dynamics of this being a very, very top-heavy industry. Now, interestingly, Europe has launched something very similar. Europe has, of course, been better known recently for its attempt to regulate AI, to the chagrin of some leaders in that region, such as French President Emmanuel Macron, who are worried that Europe is spending so much time on regulating AI that it will do so at the expense of actually cultivating an AI industry locally. The European Commission is trying to address that with something that they're calling AI factories. 
This is very similar to this NAIRR in the U.S. It's meant to give AI startups and researchers in Europe access to better data sets, to more powerful computing resources, and to generally help them actually build. The European Commission tweeted yesterday, With three of the world's five most powerful supercomputers in Europe, it is time to capitalize on our digital lead and foster trustworthy AI. Our new initiatives include setting up AI factories to support European startups and small and medium enterprises, creating an AI office to oversee the implementation and enforcement of the AI Act, enhancing the availability of language data to boost language models. So once again, the idea of these AI factories from the press release is to, quote, offer a one-stop shop for startups and innovators, supporting the AI startup and research ecosystem in algorithmic development, testing evaluation, and validation of large-scale AI models, providing supercomputer-friendly programming facilities and other AI-enabling services. If you take nothing else away from this, it's that compute is very clearly a political resource now in the same way that oil or energy or anything else like that has been for years. Lastly today, some interesting comments from the White House's top science advisor. It is no secret that AI has been added to the heap of issues that divide the U.S. and China right now. One only needs to look at the basically ever-expanding sanctions the U.S. has placed on China, especially when it comes to access to advanced AI chips. But Aradi Prabhakar, the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, told the Financial Times in a recent interview that despite Chinese-U.S. trade tensions over AI, the countries were planning on trying to work together to lessen AI risks. She said steps have been taken to engage in that process. We have to try to work with Beijing. FT writes, Her comments are an explicit signal that the two powers plan to collaborate on safeguarding the rapidly developing technology, even at a time of heightened trade tensions between the countries. Now, you might remember if you've been listening to this show for a couple months, there was a big question back in November about whether China was going to participate in the UK's Bletchley Park AI Safety Summit. Well, not only did China participate, but they actually signed the Bletchley Park Agreement on standards for the technology. And to add to that, when Biden and Xi Jinping met together at a summit in California last month, AI was an area that they had committed to work together on. Said Prabhakar, We are at a moment where everyone understands that AI is the most powerful technology. Every country is bracing to use it to build a future that reflects their values. But I think the one place we can all really agree is we want to have a technology base that is safe and effective. So I think that is a good place for collaboration. Now, one other thing you might remember is that the FT had also reported earlier this month that big US AI labs like OpenAI had been engaging in secret meetings with Chinese experts on exactly these types of risks. So maybe this is a signal that from the bottoms up, as well as from the top down, hold aside issues of economic competitiveness, AI safety is an area where the world's biggest powers might try at least to align. Anyways, always interesting when it comes to AI and geopolitics. I'm sure we'll be seeing lots more of this, but for now, that is going to do it for the AI Breakdown. Until next time, peace.